Good evening. Welcome to the first FAST lecture of the 2020-2021 academic year. My name is Bailey Franzoy and I'm this year's FAST coordinator. For those of you new to the University of Michigan archaeological community, FAST is the field archaeology series on Thursday. Every month, FAST features a public-facing lecture presenting the latest in archaeological research from University of Michigan students, faculty and researchers, and some non-Michigan affiliated scholars. Lectures begin promptly at 6 p.m. FAST is generously supported by Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, the Department of Classical Studies, and the Interdepartmental Program in Classical Art and Archaeology, or IPCA for short. But FAST is ultimately made possible by an eager and engaged audience and world-class speakers. So thank you to all of you for your attendance this evening and continued participation in our intellectual community. Uh, traditionally, the September FAST lecture highlights IPCA in the field, but due to the continued impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our lives and on our research, tonight's lecture is instead called IPCA at Home. We will hear from three current Michigan PhD students who will each present their own research conducted this summer. I'll ask that you please hold your questions for each speaker until the end of the talk, just so that we're conscious about time. But if you're worried about forgetting a question that you have for either speaker one or two, you may type it, you may type it into the chat and I can read it out or you can read it out when it is time for the Q&A at the end. As per proper Zoom etiquette, I would ask that you please keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking during the Q&A. The actual presentations and this introduction, as I mentioned before, are being recorded while the Q&A portion will not. Our first speaker this evening is Shira Cohen. Shira is a sixth year PhD candidate in IPCA whose interests include state formation, mobility, pastoralism, ethnicity, and community formation, and mortuary archaeology. She is currently writing a dissertation on mobility and state formation in early Roman Italy, especially southern Latium. A staff member at Michigan's own Gabby Project, she has published a catalog of the infant burials from Area D. Today, she will be presenting knowledge from her summer internship in a presentation entitled Exploring Digital Publication Features for Archaeology. Everyone, please welcome Shira. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to try and get the screen sharing done correctly. Um, let's see how this goes. Uh, everyone should be seeing just uh, the title slide and nothing else, I hope. Yep. Great. Um, so uh, my talk today is about, I guess, the, uh, my summer project, at, which was a Rackham internship public engagement scholarship internship with Michigan Publishing, um, particularly their Fulcrum team, which is their digital publication um, team. They have a, a platform in which they put together a bunch of digital publications and, and they brought me in to do some sort of user engagement and market research to help them decide their next steps. Um, I don't have many photos, so I thought I would start by showing you the glamorous side of my summer research. Uh, which involved trips to various water sources uh, in and around Ann Arbor and some great puzzling uh, because this was in fact my view right now but also the view that I spent most of my summer sitting at my computer having a lot of Zoom conversations um, and sort of exploring the internet. But the focus of my internship was to sort of help the press and decide what is like the future of digital publication for archaeology one model that maybe many of the class attendees would be familiar with that's been um, spoken about in class talks is uh, that put forward by the Gavi Project, a Michigan um, and Kelsey project that uh, does digital native publication. This is their uh, sort of most recent um, fully published book. But beyond that, the question is really what could digital publication look like for everybody? Um, including projects with less resources or less sort of digital um, sort of cutting edge technology incorporation, as well as for all of the past publications from the, like the last 200 years, which are existing really only in scans of uh, hard copy books in the library. So how do we bring those into the digital era? There were four sort of er main areas that I focused on um, in no particular order was uh, the first one was usability. So how to make digital publications really usable for um, archeologists, for scholars, um, in terms of engaging with the data, making sure the connections are clear. To a certain extent, that's how do you replicate the things you wanna do with a physical book, but then also capturing 
the sort of potential of being going beyond the physical book. Um, I also touched on accessibility uh, of research, and that, that was less of a focus, but it's still, still incredibly important when you move away from the physical book to a digital landscape, making sure that people with sort of different uh, accessibility needs can still actually use your work. Discoverability was another major focus uh, of what I did. And that's sort of how do you actually find resources when you can't go to the library? How do you make sure that people find what they're looking for, both in terms of locating a book and looking within a digital book, right? When you can't look through things. And then the last area was sustainability. And that means sort of two things. One is sort of the longevity of a digital piece of research. What's gonna happen in 50 years, 100 years when the electrical grid goes down, um, we all live in a post-apocalyptic nightmare, um, but also sustainability of a publication model, right? Um, a lot of resources go into a lot of very cutting edge uh, digital humanities work and they often don't survive five to 10, more than five to 10 years because of the need to constantly update the code, um, because, and that requires money, which requires, uh, requires people, which requires money. So trying to think about how to make sort of sustainable growth in digital publication. Um, obviously the reality of what I did was a lot of, uh, you know, sort of high-minded conversations, but also a very sort of uh, dry research process. I started my summer looking at a lot of other platforms, trying to think about what is out there, what are people doing, what are the questions that would be most useful uh, for, the, um, for, the, for the Michigan publishing team in terms of where they're at? I put together an interview script, a sort of template of the questions I was gonna ask. I was using a um, structured interview research process. And I had two focuses in those interviews. One was assessing current practices. So what are people doing? How do they use both physical and digital pro um, products? But then also like, what might they wanna do, right? And what and trying to assess also, you know, often we're like, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, I want that. But also how much do you want it? What's the most important uh, thing uh, for developing? Then you have to get IRB ethics approval. This was technically a voluntary step, but one that I thought was really interesting uh, to get my feet into. It involves a lot of paperwork uh, and multiple paperwork submissions, but you can't skip it. Then I invited participants, many of whom are here in this room but also um, trying to reach out across the archeological community and around the world. We interviewed the participants. That's a lot of time spent on Zoom, talking to people at odd hours. So you're recording the meetings, taking notes, summarizing the findings to kind of scope out like, what did I learn? But then also processing that into recommendations in terms of where could things go forward. I'm not entirely sure if I can tell you all of the top secret information that I shared with Michigan Publishing in terms of uh, very detailed specifics about like small features they're going to do. Uh, I don't want them to get scooped uh, by another press. But I, uh, oh, before I, participants that I talked to, uh, I think it's really interesting to think about the whole landscape of digital publication. So I spoke with archaeologists, both archaeologists as users but also archaeologists as authors, right? We want to talk about how to create a digital publication landscape. We also have to talk to the people writing the books and writing the articles and putting together the data to make sure that what we're asking or the way we're setting up our uh, publication structure is something that they can actually do. And then the users who are themselves, you know, often the same, one and the same. Uh, I spoke to a lot of graduate students, uh, early career scholars, but also senior scholars. And there was a real range of opinions I also spoke with librarians and that included like subject specific librarians. So people like uh, Zach we have here in Michigan uh, at other universities, but also more general librarians uh, because every university uh, or library has a different structure around how purchasing um, happens. And of course you have to actually, someone has to buy the purchasing, you know, has to purchase the, the digital publications and thankfully it's not me, uh, it's not many of you. We can go to our libraries, and so we want to make sure that um, their perspective comes into the work. Uh, and then I spoke with a lot of what I call brainstormers. Um, they're not all, some of them were archaeologists, some were not, but there were people who work with digital publication and archaeology from different perspectives. So that included people in um, 
data repositories, um, working in sort of new digital humanities projects and things like that. So I spent a little time talking about some of the key takeaways that I got uh, out of it and what I think is really useful for all of us to think about when we go forward with our own projects and our own publications. Um, and the first one was a little surprising, but really that the fact that the book will never die. I spoke to some incredibly hardcore digital um, archaeologists, people who are, including people who work on like the archaeology of digital spaces, right, as a, as a type of um, evidence that they use. And even there, there was a really strong attachment to the physical book. And it comes from a couple of reasons. One, because books will, one hopes or one feels, live long after the sort of, the internet could die or, you know, we sort of maybe move through different um, digital spaces. But I think a lot of it is a really strong emotional connection that archaeologists have to objects, right? Utilitarian wise, people are like, yes, I often use the digital copy. I can take the feel, I can do all these things with it but they really, really want the book as well, in addition to, to hold, to leaf through, to smell, you know, it's a very strong emotional connection. And I think it's important to acknowledge both of those things in our work and make sure that our publications speak to both of those things. Another thing that came out of a lot of my conversations, particularly with users, is the importance, and my brains, the importance of getting the basics right. Before we get to the sort of cutting edge features, making sure that everything is actually digitized, it's OCR with a reasonable amount of quality, that your search engine can do the basic functions. Often what I was surprised about was how small people's asks were and how, uh, but how much frustration came out of a system that didn't meet some basic requirements. Um, many of you maybe have spent a lot of time on Happy Trust over the last few months. Um, and I think working more and more with digital um, sources during the pandemic has not only made us perhaps nostalgic for books, but also highlighted how frustrating just small aspects of the experience can be. Um, and that's really valuable. On the flip side, though, basics is not really enough. You also want to get people excited. And that was a... Um, that was something I looked for in conversations where I would quote different ideas. Um, it's something that I learned from a discussion with uh, the director of JSTOR Labs. It was his, his, uh, early in my internship, was their design philosophy um, among the things that they're developing. And so I looked for that excitement when you suggested, what about this? And people were like, that would be amazing. That would change everything. And so often you kind of got to like lead people to see some of the possibilities that a digital uh, environment can put together. I think on the other hand, when you have all these things, what became very clear, both in looking at projects that had been successful and projects that hadn't, was that the disciplines have to drive the change in digital spaces. Um, presses uh, and individual projects can sort of get uh, out and try things and sort of show the way and show the possibilities. But when looking particularly at linking data online, so um, the world of sort of linked open data or data integration, it's really when the discipline gets together and sees the potential for research that things really move forward. Um, the, the primary example of this is numismatics, which has really come together as a discipline to create key standards. And they brought a broad coalition of scholars together and it's really taken off. Um, other initiatives, have tried and kind of sort of never reached that critical mass. What that means for a press and what that means, I think, for us as archaeologists is both to embrace it within our disciplines and to sort of work collaboratively where we see the potential for digital work. Um, and also to look for presses that em embrace that idea, that embrace the ideas that we have of things to do and offer you those resources. Um, sort of working in partnership. One, the, uh, another area that I saw a great deal of difficulty and this is less um, possible to change at the early career or graduate student level, but uh, really happens at the senior scholar and the admin and like right up at the top of the discipline 
is how we work about incentive structures and the economics of academia. When I talk to many early career scholars, the most important things are, does it count for tenure? Does it count for tenure? Do I get credit for this inside the incentive structures of academia? Who's going to pay for this work? This takes hundreds of hours and I am on a really strict timeline. And so we saw a lot of the cutting digital work was sort of only taken up when people were able to get to a secure enough place in their career to try it out. Um, and I think there's a real potential there to um, make sure that we value digital publication. It's incredibly accessible, similar to how we need to value also more community engagement with our different scholars. Um, that incentive structure in economics also has, uh, is on the flip side in the library in terms of limited budgets. How do you sell books? How do you put things together? You know, being aware that not every uh, university or individual has the, the huge budget that say, the Michigan Library does. Um, and so making sure that you, you're, you're making your data and your ideas available. And open access is a really um, exciting place that's moving forward for that. Um, and one thing that I personally learned that maybe is less uh, new to many of you is that coding is way more complex than it looks. Um, sometimes I would come forward with what seems simple suggestions. I would find out that that is hundreds and hundreds of coding hours or can't be implemented at scale. Other times I would bring forward ideas that people would suggest that seemed impossible. It seemed like there's no way that you could do that. Um, and to be told, oh yeah, no, that's really easy. Yeah, that would take us a couple of days and we could, we could do that. Is that really what you want? So I think what, they're, what that suggests is that when you're putting together a publication plan, preferably before you start the project, an important piece of, uh, an important hint that I was given uh, is that it's much harder to put together a digital publication plan or a reposit data repository after you've collected the data, do it before and, and uh, consult with a data repository specialist. But um, when you are putting together what you want to do and how you want to do it, like dream really big, come up with all of the ideas. And then when you come to the specialists who can actually put that into practice, it has to be a compromise. You have to adjust. Some things might be possible. Some things might be not possible. But you don't actually know that until you ask. Um, and I found that to be really inspiring because some of the suggestions that I put forward maybe aren't actually so difficult to achieve, but I think will really um, make an impact. Hopefully you'll see them on the Michigan Press publications in the next couple of years. Um, to, uh, some, some hint perhaps is I think the importance of allowing people to explore a book in different ways so they can see different parts at the same time. Um, even in a traditional monograph, right, you want to be able to interact with catalog and text and map all uh, simultaneously. The importance of scaling um, and creating interfaces to allow people to define terms and um, put together um, linking of their data outwards to other places. And so how can you do that in a user-friendly way? So it was a really fulfilling summer project. Um, I got to talk with a lot of really interesting people. Many of you took the time out to uh, speak with me for an hour um, and be creepily recorded into a Zoom uh, recording. Uh, so yeah, I mean, later on, I think I can take questions if people have about some of the other things I learned. And I also had brought up some web pages if people are interested to see some of the cool possibilities that have already come out. Um, and yeah, and thank you to everyone and all the people at Michigan Publishing who were not here, but they were really uh, wonderful. If anyone in the future wants to do a public engagement internship program, I highly recommend it. I think the press loves archaeologists and seems to always uh, be hiring us for these internships. So that's my, that's my plug for that program, but they have so many other internships as well if anyone uh, ever wants to talk about those. All right, that's, uh, that's everything for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shira. Um, while we're switching screen sharing, I'll just introduce our next speaker, who is Alex Moskowitz. Alex is a third year PhD student at NIPCA, whose research revolves around the intersection of migration, mobility, and craft production in the Iron Age, with a specific focus on the dynamics around Sicily and South Italy. 
Today, he will be discussing his research as part of the American excavations at Morgantina in Sicily. The title of his talk is Reconstructing Household Practices, Utensils from Hellenistic Morgantina. So please welcome Alex. Okay, I'm gonna assume that everyone can see this. Okay, um, so uh, my talk today revolves kind of around two intertwined, intertwined topics. Um, first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a set of materials that I've been studying with the Contrada Agnese for the past two years with two colleagues. And second, I'll detail uh, some of the specific pathways of data collection and the management that we've used throughout the process of excavation. Um, and describe what that has enabled us to do in a fully remote season. Uh, so it kind of dovetails uh, well with some of Shira's thoughts on um, digital publication. Let's move. There it is. Okay, so there's Morgantina. Um, Morgantina is a, uh, a site in central Italy, uh, central Sicily. Uh, it has been, it has inhabitation uh, dating back to the Neolithic. Uh, there is a uh, Bronze Age. Uh, settlement on Cittadella Hill that extends through the early Iron Age, uh, at which point um, after an earthquake and some other problems, uh, the population moves down to the Cerro and Orlando Ridge um, around the fifth century, around the middle of the fifth century. Uh, and throughout this process, throughout this time period, there's an increasing engagement um, at Morgantina with um, Greek material culture, uh, with Greek architectural style. Uh, and by the time that uh, this sort of Sarah Orlando Ridge settlement uh, is built out, uh, Morgantina looks in most ways like a Hellenistic or, or a classical city state. Um, it has an orthogonal grid plan, it has a huge agora, um, and it has sort of uh, the sets of temples that you often would uh, associate with um, a, a Greek site of the classical period. Um, it's an interesting settlement if you're thinking about kind of issues of cultural engagement, of uh, colonial interactions and things of, the, of that kind of nature. Um, but specifically, what we're looking at today uh, is the Southeast Building of Morgantina, or it's been called the Southeast Building. Uh, it's uh, on the west end uh, of Morgantina, uh, near the edge of the sort of urban grid plan. Uh, it's a settlement that's been excavated at for the past, must be six years now, by the Contrada Agnese project. Uh, excavations finished completely uh, two years ago, um, or I guess a full year ago now, two seasons ago. Um, the site uh, is a mixed-use facility. Uh, it has elements that suggest industrial production, uh, commercial activity, and um, uh, sort of residential patterns in it. Um, it was destroyed uh, along with the rest of, uh, not the rest, but much of Morgantina in around 211 uh, during the, the Roman um, conquest of Sicily, um, which provides a convenient um, terminus uh, antiquem uh, for much of the site, uh, as well as for our own building, uh, a nice layer of, of tile fall uh, covers most uh, of the facility, um, which has sort of made excavation a little bit easier of the site um, for guaranteeing um, secure contexts of a sort. Um, what we're going to be talking about specifically uh, is what I've been working on with my colleagues, uh, Catherine Schenk, who's an her doctoral candidate uh, at Michigan. Uh, and Lee Lieberman, who is the director of the Digital Humanities Initiative at the Claremont Colleges and a lecturer at Pomona College. Um, we've been studying these uh, sets of what we're calling household utensils um, uh, for the past uh, around two years at this point, or at least two seasons, somewhere going on two years, something like that. Um, the utensils include kitchen items like graters, sieves, iron spits, and, and ladles. Uh, they include uh, lighting items like uh, lamps and lampstands, uh, as well as um, some other less attractive looking things that don't photograph so well, lead vessels, uh, lead spoons, um, knives, spatulas, and things like that. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, a, a who's who of the sort of household objects of the ancient world. 
uh, things that are rarely discussed in, in detail, uh, but which are kind of ubiquitous, uh, which has made a, a kind of interesting situation for us as we go uh, about trying to start our research project. Because the materials that we're working on uh, are both recognized to be pretty much everywhere, but also uh, generally under discussed because they, they pop up in the archaeological record as um, little flecks of bronze uh, or uh, kind of crappy chunks of iron like you get from the spits, uh, as, as you see at the top page. So uh, what we've really tried to do uh, as we look at these objects is try to think of them in their use context um, and, and trying to categorize the kind of behaviors that these fit into. So for this purpose, I'm going to talk a little bit just really quickly about categories of use in the sort of realm of cooking. Um, so the graders uh, at Morgantina are, are interesting. You'll see on the top a terracotta grader uh, that, that Catherine's working on. Uh, the sort of kitchen utensils are her area of publication in particular. In particular uh, the graders have a sign of use on them. Uh, there's sort of angled wear uh, reflecting consistent use practices over time. Um, and the bronze graders, uh, unfortunately, are, aren't quite as well, uh, kind of thoroughly preserved to demonstrate the same kind of um, use wear. Uh, but more sort of intensive autopsy might reflect that. Um, the graders we imagine to be involved in uh, stew production, uh, the production of soups, stews, and porridges. Uh, a doctoral dissertation of, uh, about Morgantina published. Uh, or written uh, around 15 years ago by Justin Walsh, uh, described the cuisines uh, at Morgantina in the contemporary period as based predominantly in soups, stews, and porridges. Uh, the presence of these kind of materials uh, fits uh, with uh, the sort of archaeobotanical remains that we find at Morgantina, uh, which include lentils, uh, include uh, grapes, olives, and other things. Uh, this is just a small selection of what's been found. Uh, so there's a sort of wide variety of archaeobotanicals in addition to ceramic objects like mortaria, cooking pots, uh, and uh, small bowls that sort of corroborate the, the, the idea that this was a, a common practice in the house that we're operating in. Uh, the other uh, objects that we're looking at are, are iron spits. Iron spits are almost invisible uh, in the publication record, uh, except for in the early Iron Age when they're considered uh, luxury items. Um, they have sort of a lot to offer for our imagination to open fire cooking in the ancient world, uh, for which we have pretty good evidence, uh, most explicitly, uh, as you'll see in that sort of square box for a, a cooking platform that was excavated uh, in 2015. Uh, the last uh, sort of category of uh, food production consumption that we'll be talking about here is uh, wine consumption. Uh, Morgantina, we imagined, Participate in sort of similar patterns of wine consumption or as imagined throughout most of Greece, i.e. the symposium, um, most of the Greek world rather, i.e. the symposium. Uh, one of the sort of most explicit signs of Morgantina's interaction with the outside world is this uh, example of a dog-headed Kiethos handle. Uh, this example, uh, this sort of style of Kiethos handle is found broadly. Uh, you find these, for instance, at Olynthos, uh, just to name one Kelsey project. Uh, that, that where you can find this kind of thing. You also find it in, in alternative forms at Morgantina. Uh, this uh, full ladle here is, from, is made of silver and is from the Morgantina Silver Hoard, which uh, was once the Met, um, but after a sort of extended lawsuit has now been retained by Janet Rose, who did from originally. Um, so these are the kind of uh, practices that, we that we're trying to insert these objects back into. Um, Lamps are another area of uh, study. This is what I'm specifically working on. Um, and what you'll see here in the center is a, an example of a, a molded lamp. Those are two uh, Eros figurines. There's a, a, a sprig of ivy in the center. Um, this uh, style of lamp has very close par uh, parallels to uh, Tel Anafa, um, which is another sort of Kelsey site. So just tying Morgantina in with uh, the broader Mediterranean community of the Hellenistic world. But uh, what I really want to talk about uh, for the remainder of my time is digital publications, um, because Morgantina uh, is an interesting settlement um, for 
thinking about how we collect data through the process of excavation uh, and how that sort of pattern of data collection uh, can facilitate uh, easier publication, particularly in a time period when none of us are allowed to go to our sites. Um, so Morgantine is lucky, or the Conchata Agnese project is, is lucky maybe for, for a little bit of foresight. Um, our order of operations at, at CAP are uh, very data heavy. Um, each trench enters, uh, each trench creates digital context sheets in real time on iPads that upload directly to the main server, uh, which is accessible digitally, uh, accessible uh, via the internet rather. Um, there's a persistent attention to geospatial data with points taken on almost every non-ceramic find uh, in architectural find. Outside of field work, CAP has a robust finds team uh, every season of three to five members who diligently measure, measure study, photograph, uh, and sometimes draw the objects that we uncover. This is in addition to the member of our, members of our ceramics team and our two conservators who also take notes in the database. This is all to say that before study seasons ever begin at Morgantina, uh, we have an immense amount uh, of sort of data that we have at our use, right? Uh, there's been a lot of collections. Oh, we know exactly what materials were used to conserve the objects. We know their measurements before and after treatment. Uh, and we have the sort of original descriptions provided by um, our finds team. Uh, this is all housed in a, an open source uh, database that was constructed by uh, Morgan Tina's data sort of guru, uh, data manager, Luke Lieberman, who's also a collaborator, Catherine and mine, uh, in publishing these objects, uh, which gives us a lot of flexibility in imagining how we want the database to look. Uh, because the way you want a database to look when you're excavating is different from the way that you want it to look when you're more closely looking at the objects uh, and when you're thinking about publication. Uh, so this summer, Catherine, Lee, and I spent a lot of time uh, talking not just about our materials, but about how we thought the database should look and how we can transition the database towards being publication facing, both for the purpose of us as we compose the publication, but also for the purpose of sending this to publishers for distribution and for ease of analysis by people looking at it who aren't familiar with their own database. This FileMaker, which this database uh, is built out of, isn't the most accessible uh, of systems, as uh, I'm sure some people in this room know, uh, or in this Zoom call know. Uh, so this is us. This is our team uh, from the summer uh, doing our, our work. Um, we had Zoom calls uh, for a short uh, one week. Uh, plus a uh, Zoom season, a remote season, uh, which was a good time, uh, and managed to sort of center us a little bit uh, as we all worked on this, uh, this material together, sort of apart. Uh, we started uh, by putting everything in, um, in our sort of Google Docs, uh, and then quickly transitioned to changing the way the database looked. Uh, we, we altered the way that the database uh, functioned and the way, they, way it was structured in order to make it more easy uh, for us to export explicitly for the sake of the publication in the future. Uh, and I think this is a really huge strength of, of CAP's structure uh, and of using a sort of integrated database that has data that's entered into it constantly and consistently from the beginning of the excavation process onwards, uh, because we have an immense amount of data at our fingertips such that we didn't need to do that much autopsy in order to prepare these objects for publication, which is a rare state to be in in excavation, I think, and in archaeological fieldwork in general. Uh, so we made uh, the items that were most relevant to the publication uh, evident um, at the top. Uh, we have the catalog information here. Um, in the next uh, sort of drop down menu, we have internal notes, we have spaces for the chapter information. Uh, and this is also relevant because not all of these objects are going to end up in, in the catalog. You can see at the top uh, this sort of publication rank feature, uh, which says catalog. There are a lot of objects that are excluded from the publication for sacred space. Uh, I mean, Shira was saying the book is not going anywhere, and that's true. Uh, and there are certain uh, constrictions and constraints that are necessary from having a book. Um, but Thankfully, that doesn't mean we have to cut objects out of our, our publication. We can publish them digitally. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that we have a sort of thorough of uh, sort of data spread and description as we can. Um, I guess I'll just finish uh, by talking a little bit, by just saying a, a word or two about the sort of value of doing this. 
Um, I think that it's important to note that, that data curation can't be an after excavation activity. Uh, and COVID and sort of world that we're living in right now is a really good example of why. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's an accessibility and an equity issue. Uh, not everyone can make it to, every, to their archaeological site every summer. Uh, and blocking the people out from a publication who might otherwise not be able to attend uh, because of sort of lack of database curation uh, creates a, a barrier to access uh, for archaeologists. So keeping an up-to-date database that's adequately um, sort of filled, adequately maintained, and that's attended to constantly and consistently makes an archaeological project more equitable to all its participants, which is a, a sort of huge boon uh, to our project and to any project that sort of really takes attention to its data curation. And then, like Shira said, uh, a publication that's digital can't be um, made into a digital publication without being thought of beforehand. So just like that, an excavation that wants to be digitally sort of savvy has to start out digitally and you have to think about your sort of patterns of data curation from the beginning. Um, so with that, uh, I, I'll just say thanks. Um, it was a, a sort of weird summer, but ended up being a surprisingly productive summer because of the only thing we had at our fingertips. Um, so thank you to CAP for letting me publish data. Uh, thank you to my collaborators. Thank you to Bailey for running this. And thanks to the Kelsey. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, once again, if you have any burning questions, I'll ask you to either type them into the Zoom chat for um, them to be read out later during the Q&A. But um, right now I'm going to introduce Zoe while she sets up a uh, screen share. So our final speaker this evening is Zoe Ortiz. Zoe is a sixth year IPCA student. Her primary interests are in pottery analysis, the cultural reception of imperial statuary, and exhibition development for classical antiquities. And she has been a longtime member of the field staff at Michigan's Gabi Project. Her talk this evening will be about Gabi, specifically the Gabi altar, unlocking its meaning and purpose. Please welcome Zoe. Bailey, am I good to go? You can see me and hear me. Okay, great. All right, hi everyone. Um, so thank you Bailey for that introduction. As Bailey said, I have been a staff member of the Gabby Project for six years, seven years, a long time. And uh, my research focuses on a set of statues, a set of marbles, um, so statues and inscriptions that were discovered there in the late 18th century. As I have given this presentation in some way or another, um, I think to many of you, I decided that maybe what would be more interesting is if I delve a little bit deeper into one of like a case study um, that I was able to look at more closely this summer and will be a focus of uh, an article, hopefully itself. So with that, um, I still feel I need to give some kind of background information of Gabby just well, some people who might not know about it. Um, so Gabi uh, is a city that we have some traces of, I think as late as to the eighth or seventh century. But what we focus on mostly at the Gabi um, project is the Republican era. And that you could see is um, to the Eastern side. And that's where the project run by Dr. Terranato and where the Gabi project has been um, executed for the past 12 years. What I focus on, however, is this section over here. So the big structure is the Temple of Juno, and right to the southeast of that is what is known as Hamilton's Forum. This is a space that was excavated by the Supervendenza in the 1990s, and is very little published, so we don't know much about it, unfortunately. Um, but according to the excavators at the time, and just basic visual analysis, it does seem to match up with what, how Hamilton, the, the original excavator of the area, described the site. So I was able to walk into there um, and take a look around, but first here is the drawings of the site, of um, 
the forum. So this was executed by a man named Ennio Q. Visconti, who was a collaborator with Hamilton, and he also was, worked for the Borghese estate. Borghese estate um, was the ones who were financing this whole project, and so they were the ones who were going to receive all the sculptures after the excavation was completed. So Visconti was the one who was in charge of both um, overlooking how the sculptures were finished and restored, but also to publish the catalog. So what we're seeing here are his representations of what Hamilton actually found. So to the right is your plan and to the left is his um, reconstruction. There are plenty, plenty of things that are incorrect about this reconstruction, but it does give us a general sense that what Hamilton found was a public space that had, that had plenty of areas suitable for sculpture. So as I said, I was able to take a look into it. So I kind of just wanted to show you all. This is technically pictures that maybe I wasn't allowed to take, so please don't share. Um, so this is the area. Um, as you can see, uh, there's still some fairly remaining, some pretty high walls in the back. Really interesting thing right here is um, there was uh, frescoes that were discovered by the Sopranenza team. So Hamilton himself never actually found these frescoes. He described the walls as being quite plain. And this is because there was a concretization kind of material that had developed on top of it. And so when the Sopranenza team found out about or realized the case, they brought in um, conservators who were able to remove this material and it revealed like these unbelievably beautiful frescoes that pretty much nobody knows about. No, like I've been studying it for two years and I walked in and that was the first time I ever saw it. So it was quite fantastic to see. Um, I am hopefully one day going to be able to go in here and do some kind of uh, recording of the space, but that is, you know, to be determined, especially in the current climate. Um, this is the Publication, I just wanted to show you real quick. So this is what uh, Visconti wrote about all the different sculptures. He did a little um, description and analysis of each sculpture, and he also did drawings. So here are examples of the sculptures to the left, currently in the Louvre Museum, and then Visconti's own drawings to the right. He has drawn every single one, and this gives us a great insight into what kind of modifications he performed. Um, very interesting thing about Visconti is that he really is at this precipice of still having his foot in this idea of the aesthetics of the Connor Shore ship, like that what mattered was the complete sculpture, what mattered was that it was something recognizable, very Roman and very pretty, so that because this is still the, the clients of the time. But in his publication, we see that he's also trying to look at this maybe from a more scientific perspective. He's trying to understand these sculptures, what role maybe they played. And in some cases, he even leaves some of them completely unrestored. So it gives us this sense that maybe he's taking some of those first steps towards what is now our basic approach to archeology span that we're trying to understand more than just a pretty sculpture. So this isn't the topic of my talk, but I did want to show you some of the more of the um, the sculpture. So these two pieces that are in the middle are the pieces that he left incomplete, which gives us great insight into how these sculptures were created. It might even help us identify workshops. That's kind of a project underway by the Louvre researchers themselves. Um, there are some pieces that are missing. So this one to the left is, um, it has not been seen, I think, for the past 200 years. Uh, here are more examples. So these are, this is probably the most impressive set, in my opinion, of the sculptures that were found by Hamilton. They are um, several Julia Claudians, and these have the fewest amount of restoration. So these are almost as complete um, as they were when they were originally at Gabby. Um, obviously, I could say quite a lot more about these sculptures, including the inscriptions that were found alongside them, which gives us incredible information about Gabby during the imperial period. And it also gives us a context of these sculptures. So of course I, I'd be, I'd welcome any questions about that. But moving on to what I wanted to show you, um, those are just some more. 
So this piece is perhaps the largest conundrum of the whole collection. Every single person I've shown it to has no idea what it is, <laughs> um, which is great and terrifying and exciting and fun all wrapped into one because it's been quite a blast for me to try and dive deeper into what it is, what it represents, what function did it have. So as of right now, it is called an altar. That is how it is listed um, by the Louvre. And it's also what Visconti himself uh, eventually decided it was. But there are several things that make this um, a very, it's very challenging to call it a simple, a regular altar, a more or less regular Roman altar. And I will go into those uh, in one minute. But um, what we have here is 12 gods. Let me see. I might be flipping back and forth to show you, but I apologize for my really bad <clears throat> handwriting, but this was me just trying to figure out the order of these gods. So these are 12 gods. They might not be always the ones that you expect when it comes to something like they're supposed to represent the, the calendar year. Um, there's Vulcan is not often seen in the calendar year, but that doesn't mean it doesn't, he doesn't show up at times. Um, and then what's along the side is the zodiacs, uh, the sign of the zodiac. So like here's Gemini, oops, excuse me. Um, sorry, one second. Um, so here we have Gemini and next to Gemini is a winged turtle, which is very interesting because I've never found a winged turtle anywhere else. Um, but wings represent Mercury and so do turtles. So I think someone was just like, I like both of them. Let's have both. And so we have a winged turtle. Uh, and so how this works is that each sign, zodiac sign, is next to um, a god, a, an attribute of a god or goddess that go that is known to go with that zodiac sign. So flipping back to this next or this page before, um, what we have here is it's called the Calendario Rustico. It was identified by Visconti as matching exactly the same um, zodiac and gods together. So if, I know it's a little bit small, but if you look here, so this is Capricorn on the far left, and then you'll see that the, the tutelary god that's listed in this calendar is Juno. So when we go to the zodiac signs that are along the edge, um, See Capricorn. Uh, sorry, one of these is Capricorn, and it's next to the sign for Juno. Sorry, I can't see it. But um, so they they all match up. And so what's really interesting. So this is a, a drawing done by another artist. What's really interesting is that the zodiac along the side makes complete sense. It's in the order you would expect. It's next to gods or goddesses that you you would expect them to be. The order of the gods on the top though, on, this, on the top plane, make no sense, um, as far as I can tell. And literally every person, a researcher or scholar that has talked about this at all, usually gives a detailed explanation or a detailed um, description, and then says something along the lines of, the order doesn't, I don't know what the order represents, this is all I have to say. And then they move on to the next thing that they want to talk about. So it's literally anyone who has kind of touched on this was like, oh, this is neat and this is weird. Moving on. Um, so my goal is to actually maybe try and figure out what it is and what it represents. I have not really had any um, epiphanies about the order of the gods on top, but I have been looking deeper into what this actually could be. Um, so there are three main examples, or three, excuse me, three main possibilities that have been discussed over the years. Um, the first one is suggesting that maybe it's a sundial. Uh, sundials, you know, it's not surprising to see something that's round. What we have here is, I think, a, basically an unofficial experiment done by the Louvre, um, <laughs> and they took pictures of it. And although it's very intriguing and um, interesting to think that it's a sundial. Uh, there, in my research, there are no sundials, Roman sundials that exist that do not have etch markings um, for the different, for telling the time. There's always these etchings. 
And so whereas our sculpture, our altar, doesn't have anything even close to that. On top of that, um, it doesn't make that much sense for, for if there was a sundial. A sundial would have a gnomon, which is the, the piece in the middle. Um, it doesn't make too much sense for it to be recessed all the way down. Um, it wouldn't be necessary. So understanding why there's basically this small, it's about a one to two inch recess, um, doesn't necessarily fit with how a sundial works. Also, I forgot to mention, if you look closely at the altar, you'll see these little tiny slits. These are openings that um, Visconti records as having little bits of metal in them. So it was very clear that something was installed in the middle, some type of metal furnishment. So that's why maybe they thought it could be a sundial, but it's not the strongest um, suggestion at the moment. Also, Visconti himself suggests thought that maybe it could be a sundial, and he also eventually dismisses this idea. The next idea, of course, is the altar, right? And we do call it a Gabby altar. Visconti himself settled on this idea as being an altar. Um, the only problem is, and it very well could be just an altar that we don't fully understand, um, is that any altar I've ever seen or found or come across, and I've been trying to look at as many as I can since I've been doing this project, it, they all have very flat tops. And that makes sense, right? Because that's where the activity happens. That's where the sacrifice happens. Um, at most, you'll see what you see here on the left, um, where sometimes they'd have like scrolls, um, but that's usually always on the side, along the side. To have such ornation on top, um, just to me, especially, seems like it would be so obstructive to the person who is doing the sacrifice, especially if it is an animal sacrifice, which requires, you know, some physical labor of sorts. So, and on top of that, there isn't that much, um, there's maybe potentially some markings of smoke on Zeus, like the, uh, the ash um, of smoke, but aside from that, there isn't too much evidence of any kind of fire where, but then again, this also has been cleaned by the Louvre over the past 200 years, also by this country itself. Um, so it could possibly be an altar. The other one, the other possibility that I don't have a picture for is sometimes people think it's a wellhead. Um, of course, it has the general shape of a wellhead, and Normans actually were known to decorate wellheads um, very intricately, surprisingly intricately. But this doesn't work for uh, several reasons, because, um, sorry that I'm kind of jumping around, but or in order for it to be a wellhead, it would either need to be hollow so that there could be um, access, or because a lot of times what it is, it's almost like a hollow pillar that's um, sculpted along the sides and then topped with usually like a bronze um, lid or some kind of metal lid, because that's how they were able to get access to the well. So since there's no, it doesn't have a hollow middle, then the only other option is that it's the top itself and it is incredibly heavy. It is basically a solid piece of marble. It is about, I would say, three feet across um, in diameter. So to me, that also seems like it doesn't make too much sense. So the idea that I'm working with now, um, which honestly, I, I just, this was my research this summer, but I'm really kind of only dipping my toe at the moment um, into this kind of research is that it is an altar, but it's not an altar for animal sacrifices. So one thing that I've kind of come across in my research, like that I was not expecting, was that there is a fair amount of evidence of female worship, empress worship. So um, as I've mentioned before, there's worship, sort of worship for Domitia, who's the empress and wife of Domitian. But we also have um, inscriptions that outline that there was a cult for the health and safety of the empress. And we have several women who are quite wealthy. And so I started thinking about this idea that there is this women cult priestess presence. And in my research, Emily uh, Himmelrich, she, she's like the pr premier scholar about women priestess in Italy. She often mentions that there's very little representations of women uh, performing animal sacrifices. It might have happened, and this is a big question, but there's very little evidence of it. There's maybe one or two 
um, visual representations of this. And as we all know, sacrifices was a very common theme or subject matter in a lot of um, sculptural friezes. So we don't have that kind of evidence, but what we do have evidence for is that women would often, um, women priestesses would often give libations or incense or um, cakes. Like we even see this on the fresco, the Villa of Mysteries. So this is not an uncommon thing to kind of give these smaller offerings. And what, why I think that this is really kind of fascinating because it brings it all together is that the, what the priestesses would worship or sorry, celebrate most, like the most common thing you hear them celebrating is the birthday of the empress, uh, the birthday of the diva. So what does this, like if we know anything about this altar, we know that it represents a calendar year. So this is the anniversary, right? The analyst, like the ring, like it's all, this is meant to represent that circular time so that this is the place where those annual worships, those annual events can be recognized. So I don't know if, this is even an idea that there are altars for these, I call them lower tier, I, I need to come up with, I think, a better term, but these non-animal sacrifice um, offerings. And so this is the idea that I'm playing with. I think it's kind of exciting to think about sculptures that maybe had, um, I'm sorry, altars that maybe had very specific purposes as opposed to this is a general worshiping altar for the Romans. Um, I feel like I still have quite a lot to, you know, look into, but uh, I am working with this idea of like what's on the left is a, pap a patura, which is an offering dish, and this is what often the libations or the cakes or the incense or all those things would be put on. And often those were in bronze or some kind of metal. And so it's imaginable that um, in the middle was some kind of bronze patura that they uh, were able to put the libations on and also take it off and clean. Um, so this is where I'm at right now with my research. Uh, I very much want to hear what everybody thinks because like I said, this is a very, very unusual piece. It is the earliest known Roman sculpture to have um, the visualization of the gods with the zodiac. And the zodiac is, is at least from 800 BC, maybe even earlier than that, from the Babylonians. So the idea of the zodiac is not uncommon, and the idea of having gods associated with the months is not uncommon. But for some reason, even though this is from the Hadrian period, um, it's still the, one of the earliest known pieces to have the gods visually represented with the zodiac. So this is my research. These are my ideas, and um, I definitely wanted to present them all to you today because it's just I think these are just one of those things where I'm going to take the ideas and uh, thoughts where I can find them because it's so interesting and it's so different, but I really want to kind of unlock what uh, this, the interesting secrets that this altar might hold. So thank you to Bailey and thank you to all of you and I look forward to uh, your comments and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, so we have a few minutes now for people to ask questions to any of our three speakers. You can either write them in the chat or um, unmute yourself. If two people start talking at the same time, I guess we'll go um, alphabetical order. Um, so questions for Alex, Shira, or Zoe. Uh, Buck asks, Zoe, if it's an altar, what is the role of the metal fittings, do you think? Yeah, what I was trying to get at, I guess, was that perhaps that's where a metal bowl would would be installed, or a metal something would be installed, and that's what the offerings would go on to, which is a concept that we've seen before. 